I hope. Um, yeah, welcome everybody. This is our first virtual meeting of the Brantford Historical Society. It's a sign of the times, I guess. And um, I'm, I'm interested to see how well this works. I'm excited about everybody being here tonight. And I wanna introduce our speaker for tonight. Um, our speaker has been very patient with us as we've worked through this time of COVID and we had to postpone a couple of times. And then I have to see if he was willing to do it. And he was more than uh, gracious about doing it online. So uh, our speaker tonight is Julian Eicher. And I'm just gonna give you a little background on Julian before I turn over the program to him. He is 27 years old, he's a Frenchman, and he is the president of the Lafayette Trail Incorporated. And there's a website uh, called Laf the LafayetteTrail.org that I'm sure he's gonna mention tonight. But it's a nonprofit organization. The corporation is the result of an idea which Julian first developed while he was interning as a junior diplomat at the consulate of France in Boston in 2017. So it's a relatively new organization. The company endeavors to document, map, mark, and promote General Lafayette's 13-month month visit, 13 month visit to the U.S. in 1824 and 25. This was known as his triumphal tour or farewell tour. And a little bit about Julian now. He uh, holds a bachelor's degree with double majors in history and geography, as well as two master's degrees in human geography and digital geographies. In April of 2018, he was the youngest member of the French presidential delegation accompanying President Macron, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, Julian, so help me with that maybe, of France during his state visit to Washington, D.C. The Lafayette Trail Project was formed for three reasons, and that was one, to introduce Lafayette and his legacy to existing and future generations. Number two, to remind Americans of the significance of the Franco-American Alliance, which ultimately brought U.S. independence. And th number three, to raise awareness about Lafayette's consistent advocacy of ab abolitionism and human rights and its potential to tell a uniting story as the country revisits the legacy of the founding generation and scrutinizes its relationship with slavery. So without further ado, I give everyone Julian Eicher. Thanks, Julian. You got it, Mike. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. It's a pleasure to be with you tonight. I uh, hope you all had a wonderful Labor Day weekend. I want to thank, of course, Jenna at the Blackstone Library and Mike at the Brentford Historical Society for hosting the event. Uh, I've got to say you have a beautiful weather, it looks like, tonight. Uh, uh, Mike, good for you. <laughs> so uh, I, I hope everybody tonight uh, uh, appreciates the, 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 the idea behind the program. I, I, I'm going to try to explain in detail the significance of the tour of the Marquis de Lafayette when he came back in 1824 um, for the last time. And I'm going to use, of course, the state of Connecticut um, as a, uh, an example to show what the tour reveals about the country, uh, how the country and Americans thought about themselves and their political system in comparison with uh, Europe. And of course, we're going to talk about what role Lafayette plays in the middle of all of this after so long of an absence you know, between the Revolutionary War and the tour of 1824, uh, what happened. And, uh, it's actually a, a capsule of what's going on in 1824 uh, at the time. When you look at Lafayette's tour, you're going to be able to understand the phenomenon that are going on in America at the time. So I would like to start by uh, introducing the company. Of course, as uh, Mike has done a little bit, I do want to mention a couple more things. Um, so let's get started real quick. We do document at the Lafayette Trail. We document. We map. We mark and we promote the visits of the Marquis de Lafayette in 1824 uh, for a lot of reasons that I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to I'm going to get started by saying a couple of things that um, you might you might be familiar with already. The sense that Lafayette for America today and Americans is mostly known for um, I would say is military aid, the military aid he provided during the Revolutionary War, and he should be known for that. There's no question about it. What we're going to try to do tonight is to shed some light on other reasons why you might have an interest, an interest in Lafayette today in 2020. Uh, Mike, in the introduction, 
mentioned that, that America at the time today is um, going through a basically revisiting, America is revisiting the legacy of the founding generation. Um, and Lafayette's legacy really stands out when you compare uh, with the rest of the founding fathers. And we're going to try to explain why and what kind of inspiration his legacy can be for the country today. So um, I want to start with this, obviously, uh, the website that the Lafayette Trail has online. I encourage you all to go take a look at it if you haven't done it already. This is a website that has many resources. Whether you want to hear more about Lafayette, who he was, uh, the motivations behind his journey to America when he was 19 years old, we have a section about that on the website. We have all our digital resources, whether uh, the map that will show Lafayette's stops all over the country, um, our marker maps. We install historical markers. I'm going to talk to you a little bit uh, about this in just a moment. And other maps that we have, other resources, um, you know, social media, of course, and all of that. So take a look at the website. Uh, I, I think uh, it, will, it, will be a, it will be a nice experience, I hope. Um, our main resource on the website of the Lafayette Trail, as I said, is a map that shows you what Lafayette did in 1824. Uh, so let's take a look at this map real quick. If you can take a look at here um, on the screen, you will see um, this 24, 25 now with West Virginia. You, you, you will see the 25 states that Lafayette visited in 1824, 1825. So you see a bunch of clusters, uh, you know, numbers here of different colors. So this indicates the number of stops that Lafayette made in a specific area, right? So if I zoom in, I can move around a little bit. So in blue here, the blue line represents the journey that he took in 1825 around the south, mostly and the west, okay? So up the Mississippi here, going back on the Ohio, Kentucky, uh, Ohio, Pennsylvania, okay? So this is blue, and in green is the road, the route that he used in 1824, which is the one we're gonna talk mostly about tonight because that's when he visited Connecticut. So if I go on, I can zoom in, I see these clusters of points that are actually getting broken down into smaller numbers. So ultimately, when I get to a point when uh, those numbers, so for instance here, you know, the number six here represents that within this blue area, there are six stops that Lafayette made. So if I zoom in the maximum, I'm going to see that um, those the, the individual dots appear at the very end, okay? So I, I'm, I can click on one of them, for instance, and take a look at what shows up. So we have, for instance, the city of Lyme, Connecticut. You have a photo of the place where he had breakfast, Lafayette, on the 20, uh, 22nd of August, uh, a caption of what he did. And you can take a look at the photo. You can download the photo. So we want it to be interactive. We want people to have a nice experience as they navigate our resources. You can change the base map if you want. I don't know if you like gray or if you like dark or if you like uh, street view, whatever. You can play with it. You can make it your own. We want this experience to be as pleasant as possible. You can also query the database and inquire, for instance, state by state what Lafayette did. So I'm going to zoom again on Connecticut and I'm going to say to my database here, um, I would like um, to query a database and I would like you to return the data for a state that contains the, le this, the letter C-O-N-N. And if I run my query, it's going to get back Connecticut telling me the number of stops Lafayette made as well as the population of the state in 1824. So I can download this, this data for whatever reason, if I need to talk to a decision maker, if I want to show it to kids, if I want to use it in another data set, it's interactive. So we want this data to be out there. We don't want it to be only on our website, but we certainly want to educate people about the significance of the tour. And that's one way we do it. And the second resource that we have is actually a marker program that we develop in partnership with uh, the William G. Palmari Foundation. It's a foundation that's based in New York State. We have a great partnership with the foundation in which we are eventually going to install markers, at least 125 historic markers, Lafayette Trail markers around the country in sites of local, state, and national significance. So we have some requirements to consider a site for funding. Number one, of course, is going to be the presence of primary source documentation. So take a look at this design of our markers. This is one of our markers that was installed in New York State recently. That's actually the first one that was installed and so far the only one that has been installed because of course of COVID-19. We've got a, we had to stall a, a lot of our in-person events uh, to abide by public health concern, uh, of course, and orders from all the states that we operate in. So 25, as you can imagine, it's a lot. 
So the, the design is not an accident, obviously. What we want to do with this design, uh, with the foundation of the Lafayette Trail as well, is to honor symbolically the national colors of both our countries. So the United States and France, they share the same national colors, blue, white, and red. We have a logo of the Lafayette Trail on top. And we have a straightforward message that focuses on uh, the main events that happened when Lafayette was in a community, in this case here, Whitehall, New York. And um, we want people to take a snapshot at a marker and that it triggers a reflection, some thoughts about uh, what, did, what is this marker doing here? And then what does it say about Lafayette? Who was Lafayette? Oh, really, he had a tour, I didn't know that. So yeah, he had a tour. <laughs> Um, so primary source documentation is what we require to fund those markers. So for instance, here I'm using Connecticut. There's a paper from Greenwich, Connecticut that shows you how Connecticut started preparing itself for the visit of Lafayette. Uh, and he was here very early during his tour, okay? He came to New York on August 16th, 1824. Four days later, basically, he was on the way uh, to Boston and he started making stops along Coastal Connecticut first, so August 20th to August 23rd, he traveled from Greenwich all the way to Plainfield, Connecticut, and then entered Rhode Island, and then the, he came back a second time, um, of September 3rd and 4th, 1824, on the way back from Boston, going to Hartford and get on a boat. I'm going to talk th about that in a little bit. So this is an example of the sources that we require to fund a marker, potentially. Um, we also can use, for instance, a map. So if I want to place a marker at a site, I do want to say that um, uh, the site, uh, I can show the historical location for it and uh, basically show using a map, for instance, here, this is a map of Lyme, Connecticut in 1818. I can show uh, the building that I'm interested in, that it was on a specific site at the time and that today it matches the location of a map that shows the site being at the same place for 200 years. So this is the way we demonstrate uh, continuity in a historical event, whether it's the building or uh, a episode, an event that's reported in the newspapers. Um, and then ultimately when we place those markers, we have another map that will then show you where those markers are located, okay? So for instance, the one in Whitehall, New York, okay? You'll have it here on the data base and same thing, you'll have an explanation here, the date when it was installed, the name of the city and the photo of the marker. So we don't have a lot at the moment for a variety of reasons, number one, COVID-19, but we should have more pretty soon and I'm, I'm excited to share that with, uh, with you tonight, some of them at least. So a little bit of background about Lafayette, it's good to talk about this tour, but I do wanna make sure uh, there is, everybody has the same background uh, before we tackle the tour and get into what he did in Connecticut. Uh, so I was saying Lafayette during the Revolutionary War is known for helping militarily the United States, so at the time the Continental Army, uh, in trying to secure independence. So um, actually two days from now, basically a few, some years ago on September 11th, um, 1777, Lafayette had his first uh, military involvement in America um, and he was then wounded at the Battle of Brandywine. This was his first military uh, participation in North America in which he was uh, basically um, acknowledged as a, um, one of the Americans. Right, so a lot of times you had some French officers that would come to America and they would ask for what you would call now a fat paycheck and then they would do nothing in return. So Lafayette came to the United States with totally different intentions. And what he wanted to do, as he said himself, said, I don't want to teach, I want to learn. Uh, and that really got him to be appreciated very vividly by a lot of the officers and you know the soldiers at the time, including of course, George Washington, who he would befriend. And, Eventually, they would become lifelong friends, and uh, you know he he was like, as many sources report, a paternal friend for uh, Washington, who never never had a uh, for Lafayette, and of course Washington never had a son, so they had this special bond together. So that was the first time he came. I imagine France at the time does not allow any of its of his citizens to leave France and participate in a venture that would be hostile to British interests because of the war. Uh, the Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War, as you call it, in America. And um, the result is that Lafayette had to go rogue and um, basically fit out his own fr uh, ship. Uh, so they left from Spain and they went to South Carolina on a ship. 
uh, La Victoire, the victory in English. And uh, that was the, the beginning of his American adventure. So that's the first time he came. So we have brandy wine, you know, as one of the uh, episodes that are reported. We have Newport, we have Monmouth. But there are a lot of the uh, battles, basically, that Lafayette is associated with during his first time in America. So at the end of 1779, Lafayette goes back to France. And this time, after some correspondence letters with leaders in France and people at the court of the king, um, he is actually um, starting to trigger some reaction in France that people might consider really helping officially uh, the Continental Army uh, to secure independence from Great Britain. So he comes back um, in 1780 aboard the famous ship L'Hermione uh, that goes to Boston at the time. And with him, actually, much a little later, will be uh, he will be bringing, or as a result of his actions, the French will send an expeditionary force that will actually be um, a an eventful moment for the the future United States because because of that alliance, the Franco-American alliance that Lafayette helped uh, quite considerably to start. Um, there was it led eventually to uh, one of the battles that you heard of as a pivotal moment for the American Revolution was the Battle of Yorktown. 1781. So this is all during Lafayette's earlier time in the country. But he should be known for that. But what I'm saying is there's, there are more reasons to be interested in Lafayette and just his military achievements at the very beginning of the nation. You have a lot of other French officers that can be actually praised for similar reasons, military mostly. But there are things that Lafayette could, uh, contributed to the United States that has started to get national attention. And that's really what I'm going to try to uh, focus on tonight with Connecticut as an example. Um, and of course, when I say that, I have to talk about Alabama first, but uh, what I wanna say is that Lafayette was a friend of um, the Native Americans. So one of our markers that we work uh, on at the moment is a marker that commemorates actually re reception on the Chattahoochee River by Native Americans. I do wanna point that out real quick because uh, part of the legacy that I want, that we try so hard at the Lafayette Trail to uh, to get out there, the legacy of Lafayette is that he was a friend of the Native Americans and he was a very early abolitionist, which is very rare and quite unique when I'm going to explain why uh, in just a moment. We want to make sure that Americans in 2020 know of that part of Lafayette's legacy. So, you know, he was, a leg he was actually an abolitionist, as we can tell, as far as we can tell, as early as 1783. He wrote a letter to George Washington asking him if he would join him in a venture to create a revolutionary model for a plantation in South America in which um, the, the, the workers would be rewarded um, so financially for their work and they would reach gradual um, emancipation uh, through education to basically the concern that Lafayette had was to make sure that the insertion into society once emancipation is reached would be successful in the long term and not a collapse right after uh, uh, liberty is reached for enslaved workers. So that idea was, uh, he wanted to get Washington on board with this. Now, George Washington didn't follow him on that idea, okay? So uh, in 1785, he started alone his plantation with his help of his wife in South America, what's now French Guiana. And uh, that that is really a key thing that Lafayette did. That really today is a source of inspiration for the nation because um, the founding generation did not follow him on this, okay? So it, it, was, it was not a success in the, in the, in the sense that uh, his idea didn't really take root anywhere in the, the debates at the time. But now that we start to look for ways to um, uh, reconcile Americans with the earliest time of the country as it pertains to the question of slavery, we look at really people that set themselves apart with their actions. And we have proof that Lafayette was an abolitionist, as I said, as early as 1783, 85, which is amazing. So this is a timeline that we have on the Lafayette Trail website uh, that details some of the things he did. So the letter is, of course, a big deal, 1783. But what I would like to point out here is that this is, this is a man that consistently throughout his life, Okay, it's not just to 10 years or five years or whatever. It's really, you can find moments that he did throughout his life that were benefiting, uh, you know, universal rights, the agenda to promote universal rights regardless. So uh, just to quick take, take a few examples here and there that he, he was confronting Thomas Jefferson on the subject. So of course, when he came back in 1824 as the last time, he did a lot of things. He wanted to spend time as much as he could with freedmen 
Sometimes uh, um, cities uh, would actually issue public orders to prevent enslaved workers from attending the ceremonies, public gatherings, and Lafayette would actually try to do, uh, um, give them attention to give, the, uh, uh, in this case in Yorktown or Savannah or Columbia, South Carolina, give them attention uh, as, with, as he was, he understood of course the, the status that he had in 1824. So he wanted really to promote this agenda uh, which he thought was in, of course, the national interest of the country. So this is a thing that I, I highly recommend you, you, you hear more about or you read more about, Lafayette's and abolitionist uh, legacy. So that's a map of the Guiana, uh, Guiana, French Guiana in 1783 that I want to point out. So this is a little bit of background that I wanted to provide before we start with the factual data in Connecticut. Um, and one last uh, contextual information. So I told you 1777, the first time Lafayette comes to the United States, 1780, the second time. He does this, uh, a limited visit in 1784 um, in which he's gonna mostly help do some treaties between the United States and Native Americans. And it's mostly known for a visit at George Washington's Mount Vernon at the time. And then we have almost you know, more than 40 years without any news of Lafayette in America at all. And this is a map we have on the Lafayette Trail that shows you all the towns named after him. So because of um, the census data and the way some cities qualify to be listed on a database or not, we came up with 47 towns or cities in the United States that are named after Lafayette or his castle of LaGrange. You can see that there are many of them all the way through California. What I'm getting at here is that Lafayette is a national icon of the United States collective memory, even though he was born a Frenchman. He was adopted by this country and celebrated as a national hero alongside George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, other founding fathers. And this map shows you exactly why the tour of 1825, which is the last time he came to the country, is really relevant for many uh, today. If you take a look, most of the towns that are named after Lafayette, okay, are, uh, if, if, I, if I show you real quick here, they're all around the Mississippi River here, okay? Or most of them are, which tells you that at the time, those are the newest states that joined the Union. And what did they do to show the rest of the Union that they were as American as anybody? They claimed a national hero. They welcomed him as he was traveling as an embodiment of the Revolutionary War that they would celebrate to show their uh, counterparts on the East, the East Coast, like Connecticut, that they were as Americans as as American as the Eastern states. So that's really a, a, a key, I would say, component of his legacy that he was cherished by Americans. And most of those towns were named after him after the tour of 1825. You get a bunch here and there, especially counties also that are named after Lafayette before the tour. But that's, those are really exceptions in the sense that um, most of them were named after the tour of 1825. So. I will move forward here a little bit. This is a quote from the governor of Alabama that shows you exactly what I just told you, that he believes the governor of Alabama, Lafayette, is um, basically a, um, a national hero and that he's giving them a favor by showing up physically to this part of the new American Union, okay, new parts of the Union, and witness what happens when you let liberty spread uh, to the West. So this is actually opening remarks of the governor of Alabama, uh, which is pretty telling, I think, self-explanatory. So let's get to Connecticut. I do not know this lady. I just know she is on the web page of uh, the Connecticut Historical Society. <laughs> My point with this image is that the Connecticut Historical Society was chartered in 1825. So I'm not going to say that it was chartered because of Lafayette's tour, okay? That's not what I'm going to say. What I'm going to say, however, is that because of Lafayette's visit, the country underwent a major uh, um, um, conversation about um, historical preservation. Who, who are we as the United States? We are 40 years old, uh, maybe a little more. Um, we don't even know if our political system is going to work. But the fact that Lafayette is coming back, a European, an elite, you know, wealthy family, a prominent European, uh, an international crusader for human rights. The fact that he comes back and endorses the political system tells us Americans that, yes, our country is actually unique. Our political system ought to be preserved. And we should start looking at our founding moment, which is the Revolutionary War, a little more seriously. 
we should try to preserve our legacy. We should try to organize ourselves at local, state, and federal level in order to make sure that going forward, we will, we will have the tools to preserve our history. So that wave of historical awareness translates into the chartering of historical societies, as I said, at different levels. So indirectly, for instance, in Pennsylvania, uh, the old Pennsylvania State House was renamed because of Lafayette's visit in 1824 as what you now know as Independence Hall. So in Connecticut, it's not absurd to suggest that later on, a year when the excitement is going on, it's not absurd to suggest that there might be an effect. All this enthusiasm triggered by Lafayette's visit could potentially play a role in explaining why some states like Connecticut decide to create a historical society the same year. Pennsylvania is the same way. 1824, Pennsylvania creates its own historical society. Um, okay, take a look at this. Um, population of the United States in 1780. You can see mostly that it's around the East Coast. I'm going to use my little slider on the, on the left here that you can see, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slide all the way to the end, 1830. Now, you see the difference? 1830. 1790, 1830, 1790. So what I want to say here is when Lafayette comes back, when you compare with the Revolutionary War uh, era, in 1830, you see several phenomena going on. Number one, you see the North, okay? The North is getting super uh, populated. This is due to the birth of major American cities, ports like New York City, for instance, Boston. So the North is getting industrialized. So, and that happens mostly around urban development. And you see number one, uh, that effect of the urban density that increases and translates into the uh, circles here on the map. You see also something that's going to lead to civil war, uh, you know, one or two decades later, which is a North that's industrially powered versus a South that relies on agricultural economy. You see that divide. And the last thing you're going to see, of course, when you compare 1780 to 1830, is the population of the Western states. So the Western states are basically getting populated and they generate competition for the Eastern states. And so you have all of that going on in, a, a, in the 1820s. And I wanted to say that because the regional context in which Connecticut is, is a, an industrialized area with ports, with projects like the Erie Canal in New York that are opening new spaces, uh, so generating new ways of income and creating new settlements that are competition for states like Connecticut. So what's interesting about Connecticut is, if you take a look at this, in 2016, US Census Bureau data showed that, uh, as you can see, most of the states trade partners in 2016 at the time in the US, uh, they all have Canada, almost all, you know, a few thirds have Canada as main partner, especially is true on the East Coast. I mean, except Delaware, United Kingdom, and which one? Connecticut, that has, interestingly enough, uh, France as its first trading partner. So that actually, I wonder why. I mean, why is that? You can be just as surprised as seeing France, number one trade partner of Connecticut, as you can be seeing China, uh, trade partner number one of Louisiana, right? That obviously has French and Spanish, but no. So <laughs> let's take a look at this. Why is Connecticut having France as its trade partner in 2016? So what I wanna say is, is there a way history could play a role in explaining why Connecticut has that trading relation with France? So I want to show you this. This is, of course, uh, you can't read the text, and that's not the point. The point that I'm making here is this is a chart. Uh, this is actually the original chart of this, the colony of Connecticut um, that was done in 1662. So a little bit of context. We're right after uh, Oliver Cromwell, um, you know, the, whether you know, you know him as the Lord Protector uh, or as he, he's more widely known in France, the Kingslayer. Uh, <laughs> This is actually right after this in England. Um, so Charles II, the new king, um, gets back on the throne. And Connecticut governor at the time, the colony of Connecticut, Mr. Winthrop, sails to Europe and seizes the opportunity to negotiate a new 
trade deal, what you would call now a trade deal, with the mother country, England. So they were able to man manage to have a liberal chart in the sense that they got tons of autonomy as it pertains to trade. And at the time in the 1660s, okay, if you have some freedom, you belong to the Western world, and you don't do trade with England, there's a good chance you're gonna do some trade one way or another with France, right? So that would be the beginning of an explanation why uh, that trading trade relation lasted uh, because it would be grounded in historical data, for instance. That would be that might be one interpretation for it. Another one I want to say is, if you look at if you have an interest also in the Civil War, you will see that France as a country supported the South, and they did that because they wanted the money of uh, the uh, the cotton basically the cotton money so connecticut is particular and i mentioned that the rest of new england was heavily industrialized because it developed itself as a, an agricultural state and you can see the remnants of that today still for instance because uh, there's not in connecticut one major urban center dominating the rest of the state like there is um, you know in new york like new york city versus the rest of upstate or in Boston, you know, Boston and Massachusetts, Boston versus the rest. In Connecticut, historically, New Haven and Hartford were co-capitals, they were rotated actually. So they never was a political uh, power place that would basically dictate at all. And that is, also, uh, that is also rooted in the fact that so many communities in Connecticut relied on agriculture and decided to remain local and did not really engage fully in the Industrial Revolution. And you can see, like you see the remnants today, that's a second explanation as well to what I just said. Um, so going to the tour of El Alfayette, the roads, the roads that he took when he left New York City on August 20th, okay, he entered Connecticut under, uh, as I said, Greenwich. And you might wanna know which roads he took. Well, uh, there's a major network of roads uh, at the time that's basically a legacy of the postal service. Um, like postal roads, I should say. So people like Ben Franklin uh, as postmaster generals uh, actually decided or wanted to increase the connections between you know, states, communities, and the, a postal network was a good way to do it. That's, uh, if you take a look at the data during Lafayette's tour, you will actually not be surprised that one of the persons that helps charter the, 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 the itinerary that Lafayette took throughout the South and the West was actually Postmaster General McLean uh, in the United States. Okay, so that's how heavily they relied on the road, uh, the roads, uh, postal roads. So the Lower Boston Post Road, okay, stretches from Greenwich all the way to Stowington and Rhode Island. So what Lafayette did on the 20th, he started here. He spent a night in Bridgeport, Connecticut, uh, went all the way up here, New Haven, through Brantford, of course, Guilford, Saybrook where he spent the night, that second night, okay? Then Lyme, New London, and then in New London, he veered to the north and headed north here through Norwich, spent the night up here in Plainfield, Connecticut, and then entered Rhode Island, went to Providence, and then ultimately all the way to Boston. Um, so the Postal Service, I wanna say a few things about the roads and the way another great man actually impacted uh, indirectly Lafayette's itinerary, and that man is Ben Franklin. So Ben Franklin did not invent the odometer. However, he had the idea of using it uh, to measure the numbers, the number of rotations on a carriage, a number of revolutions. And after a certain number of rotations, you would calculate a mile, basically. So what Ben Franklin, by applying the odometer to a means of transportation, what he did was to pave the way, uh, no pun intended, pave the way to having the turnpikes and eventually charging people for by the mile. So that, in, that led to, of course, new roads, okay, that no longer run on the coastal line in, of Connecticut, like those ones, that, if you follow my pointer here, but instead were more geometrically straight like Route 1 here around New Haven, and also more connecting the hinterland in the sense that um, 
it was no longer relying on ports, but what the, it was literally connecting to be faster. So increasing the time, I mean, diminishing the time to go from point A to point B and charging by the mile. Um, so if you look at this, actually, what I want to show you here is the ports historically, the first layer of post roads, very first one before the turnpikes, very often they went through the downtown of these coastal towns in Connecticut including Brantford, because the mail was delivered on a ship. So the ship comes in, then the mail is dispatched, but the point that it, the mail delivery originates from is the port. Now, when you switch the method and you go to a uh, carriage-based delivery of the mail, you actually open up what's behind the hinterland, basically, what's behind the ports. So you open up new territories to agriculture. Uh, you have these new coastal uh, uh, turnpikes that connect cities together and actually not even within Connecticut just, but also between Connecticut and Massachusetts and New York. So um, those are key facts in understanding why Lafayette's road was what it was. And it's actually due to a whole variety of parameters, whether it's technical inventions, people like Ben Franklin, um, so it, it can be a lot of things. And I have to remember, Lafayette has to travel 25 states as the nation's guest. Um, and the more he travels, the better, because the country is so divided at the time in 1824. You have this presidential election that's dividing everybody. Um, whether you support Andrew Jackson or William Crawford, Henry Clay or John Quincy Adams, everybody has its own, you know, its champion. So by Lafayette, by traveling all over the country, is able to unify even more effectively the nation. So the, literally, the faster he goes, the more united the United States is. I mean, basically. So the turnpikes. This is a paper, uh, a gentleman that wrote a paper, actually a reporter that followed along uh, Lafayette's journey. It's, it's kind of a joke. I don't know. I mean, it's funny. It's silly. Whatever you want, you want to, you want to, how you want to look at it. I think it's silly. So you take a, take a look, and you can you can you can think of it on your on your own. But the idea basically is that um, there is a toll gate. You know, the toll person collecting the toll says in Stratford, so right before New Haven, when you come from New York, um, the toll the, the this reporter says to the woman, "Wow, you're getting tons of traffic because of Lafayette today. That's amazing. I bet you get tons of money." And she says. Um, yeah, um, we do, but we don't charge the marquee. And but pe for people that are so far behind him, yeah, you gotta pay. And I just love the last sentence here because he was totally humiliated, of course, this guy. And the last sentence is this last remark quickly brought a York shilling out of my pocket for toll. And yes, you may well suppose I hastened to get out of her sight and the range of her weight. I think it's funny. Next slide. So <laughs> when Lafayette, okay, he goes through Coastal Connecticut, he goes through Brentford. The papers mention in Brentford that actually the locals received him on the way. Uh, they do not necessarily point out any building in Brentford, not that I know of. I mean, I know the Harrison House, I've been there. There's a, there was a, I remember three years ago, a, a, a lady, I don't know if she's still with you, uh, 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 Mike, uh, Jane that actually gave me a, a nice little tour of the house and show me the flip glass that you guys have in there. So that was great. And so Lafayette, actually, when he came to Brantford, I, I don't know that uh, the, the newspapers show anything about the, the Harrison house, but they certainly mentioned that some activities were going on in Brantford at the time. There's no question about it. So when he leaves Connecticut, goes all the way to Boston, okay, we're at the end of August here, um, 23rd. And then early September, he comes back from Boston through Toland, okay, Stafford Springs, Toland, and then ultimately Hartford. So this is here a copy of the address of Governor Walcott, the governor of Connecticut at the time that he gave Lafayette at the Connecticut State House, which is now the old Connecticut State House in Hartford. We're actually trying to place a market there with uh, the state of Connecticut and the nonprofit that administers the site, making great progress. So I do not expect you to take a, to read the text here. I'm not criticizing the handwriting of Governor Walcott. No way, but I do have a transcript for you to make it better, just in case you need it. So he says at the end, every 
club of citizens, okay, you can read with instantly recognize a new an illustrious benefactor of the US. And he finishes by saying, I wish you, you know, that your life be may be prosperous with a ha happy transition to a glorious immortality. That's a great, I mean, I, I, during the trail, I've, I've met some governors, you know, I, nobody ever wished me a happy transition or to a glorious immortality, whether I do something wrong or I'm too young, so I, they still think I'm immortal, whatever the reason is, never, nobody never told me that. <laughs> so I must do something wrong, right? Um, so when Lafayette comes to Connecticut, he is striked, and actually his secretary, Mr. Levasseur, is just as striked as well by three things. Three things that, according to them, explain why Connecticut is a successful state in the Union. Number one is religious freedom. That's what it emphasizes. The Secretary of Lafayette emphasizes the liberty of religion, something called the blue laws that were protecting activities on a Sunday, were prohibiting activities on a Sunday to make sure that churches didn't have much competition. So as you can imagine, um, Lafayette is a troublemaker. What does he do? He travels on a Sunday. Um, and it's not clear whether he knew that he was breaking the law or not. But of course, the newspapers at the time, they took great pleasure in reporting that the law didn't apply to him, maybe unbeknownst to him, whatever the reason, he traveled on a Sunday. So number one, uh, people are, Lovaster and Lafayette are hit by religious freedom in Connecticut as a pillar of the success of the state. Number two is education. And they really emphasize the importance of a central education, providing in each community a grammar school. And that every little community could teach basic skills at little expense. And I think it's pretty funny to have little expense on the same line as Yale College. So funny how change, things change over the years, but they do emphasize that it's very important that an affordable education be uh, given as an opportunity in every community in Connecticut. So obviously he's praising the public system at the time of schools that are educating Connecticut residents. And the third point that he makes in the state of Connecticut is of course invention. So there are three inventions that he refers to, the Shittenden machine, the machine of Miller and Whitney, and the machine of William Humphrey. I recommend you, if you want to do further research about what they're about, I highly recommend you do that. But I'm just going to tell you that they're all pertaining to agriculture, directly or indirectly, which also confirms the point I was making earlier today, uh, actually earlier, a few minutes ago, about the fact that Connecticut is strongly an agricultural state, because guess what? The inventions that the Connecticut is praised for uh, pertain to the agricultural field. So how do you explain that these innovations happen in Connecticut? Well, Connecticut is on the Atlantic you know, trade world. So it, it's opened to Europe and basically by its location, it facilitates uh, the uh, going back and forth of researchers, engineers that come and go, but they basically contribute to educating a class of people in Connecticut that have the faculties to uh, invent and then whose adventures, of course, will contribute nationally to uh, sustainability of agricultural um, economies, agricultural based economies. Is that number three? So those are things I wanted to tackle in this talk. Uh, I mean, it goes by very quickly. I've been already speaking for more than 40 minutes, so I'm just going to wrap this up. I want to say a few things. Uh, to wrap this up, we, we have published for Lafayette's birthday three days ago, the first issue of our newsletter, Be My Guest. Of course, it's a pun because Lafayette was the nation's guest. We have very nice uh, contributions in it, such as uh, an explanation of what our markers will be. So here is an example of our markers, future markers that will have their story told um, in our newsletter. The trick about the newsletter is that it is a benefit for our members. Um, so, for instance, we have this wonderful contribution of Dr. Kramer. So, for those, for those of you who don't know Dr. Kramer, he's a leading a Lafayette expert that teaches at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And he made a wonderful contribution that we're so grateful for about the emergence of American national identity, which I was telling you about a little bit in this talk that the tour of Lafayette is also about reassuring Americans about the viability and the sustainability of their political system. 
So Dr. Kramer weighs in with a lot of detail and knowledge about that. And uh, his contribution is exclusive to the Lafayette Trail, be my guest, and is available for our members to see. So uh, if all of this is something you have an interest in, if you have an interest in, I do recommend that you join the Lafayette Trail as a member. Uh, we actually are in dire financial uh, situation right now for a variety of reasons. So we do welcome any contributions that you could make to make sure that the project as we grow to include the 25 states, uh, between now and 2024 is um, brought to fruition. So there's a lot of expenses involved. 25 states, as you can imagine, is thousands of miles and it's tough, it really is. So we do welcome, we hope that you will join after this conversation that this uh, the idea that I just talked about, whether it's Lafayette and abolitionism, Lafayette and the Native Americans. So Lafayette is a national icon. For all of these reasons, uh, we believe, I believe basically that in 2020, he has a unique uh, relevance in this country. He has a unique voice, a unique message. I think it's a waste if we don't put it out there. So we do try to do it as much as we can. Of course, we're limited with funding. So we do hope that you will you will help us and assist us and join the trail to get all those benefits, whether it's a newsletter, uh, those videos we're gonna do or updates about the market dedications that will be going on in your area. We got a marker approved in Tallinn, Connecticut already. We have, as I said, we have many in the works. We have one in New London that we're working on. We have one in Lyme, Connecticut. We have one in Hartford. So in Connecticut, we have four markers already. And uh, there's certainly an enthusiasm uh, about that. So it's very simple. If you want to join the trail, you go to our website, lafayettetrail.org. Everything is explained if you want to become a member or make a contribution or both. It's very simple. And I also recommend that you follow us on social media. We do have wonderful news to share once in a while. Um, you know, key moments like Lafayette's birthday, uh, they are not to be missed. And it's just an easy way to get in touch with us and just not miss on anything uh, as the company tries to cover 25 states and make sure that everybody is covered uh, and not left behind. We want to we wanna tell the story of Lafayette's legacy and the fact that it welcomes everybody, okay? I just talked about Native Americans, African Americans. The military also, we have sites that are military lands, okay? Let's go back here. Um, uh, where is it? Here. Uh, you know, Schuyler House and Gallatin House are um, two National Park Service sites that are respectfully in New York State and Pennsylvania, but we have so many markers on military land. Uh, I'm not going to name them for the fact that uh, the process is very complicated and I don't want to make any promises that then we cannot deliver on. But we have very exciting news with feral property, military land. And we have some national like markers that are going to get some national news pretty soon, uh, for a fact I know. And uh, this is all going to happen pretty soon. So this is a, uh, a presentation of what we do at the Lafayette Trail. We hope that you enjoy that. Um, I don't know how we're going to get the questions now. I think you can, uh, I suppose, one by one and mute yourself if you want to ask the questions. I think Jenna said and Mike, uh, I am willing to answer any questions you may have, of course, and you obviously uh, can communicate with us via email. There's no problem at all. So um, as far as I'm concerned, um, you know, I'm done here and I, I just I'm going to respond to your questions as you as you have them. Okay, um, so let's see. Maybe Mike or Jenna, you want to say something here or want to well, I just wanted to say it was a wonderful presentation. I learned a lot tonight uh, that I didn't know. I'm in the dark here. Sorry, folks. But um, I'm really impressed with, with the uh, the depth of knowledge that you have. And the website looks wonderful, I'll tell you. Um, I don't have any specific questions right now, but Matt Rudolski, our president, said we have information about where Lafayette actually stopped in Brantford. Okay. Uh, are you around, Matt? Well, I'm happy if you can send me whatever you have. Uh, I mean, I have some already. I have papers. Uh, as I said, uh, it doesn't go very specifically on what Lafayette did. But uh, for our markers, I, I will mention to you that we require your primary source, okay? So it has to be from 1824, 1825 for us to be able to use it at all. But okay. um, send me whatever you have, please. By all means, I would love to take a look at it. Yep. So uh, maybe, uh, I, I suppose, Ashley, I mean, if. Ashley is our social media coordinator, Ashley Jordan. She, she does a fabulous job at the Lafayette Trail. And I think, Ashley, if, if, I don't know if you can unmute yourself, but if you can do that, why don't you just read a few questions and uh, we'll just uh, 
we'll just take it from there. Well, good, happy to. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, the first question that I found in the chat is from Susan Long. She says, I know that both Republicans and Federalists used veterans in their public events in order to promote their political ends in the 19th century. Two questions. First, during his tour or otherwise, did Lafayette ever do public events with other Revolutionary War veterans? And second, did he formally or personally identify with one party or the other? So, uh, yes, he did events with veterans all the time. Um, so <laughs> the tour of 1824 is a lot about the Revolutionary War. It's about celebrating the ideals that this country was funded upon, celebrating its uh, fighters, the people that fought to secure American independence. And basically, uh, Lafayette as a military veteran as well, he, of course, was adored, adulated, and celebrated as one of their own by the military community in this country. Now, as it pertains to Lafayette aligning himself politically, he would never do that for a very simple reason, is that the country is super divided in 1824, and why he is invited by President Monroe, it's very simple. President Monroe, the year before 1823, has this Monroe, Monroe Doctrine, okay? He wants to make sure America is now a global power, so that's kind of a statement, and that statement is confirmed by Lafayette, a, a leading European well-known, going to the U.S. and endorsing the political system. So the country with the presidential election that's super dividing uh, cannot afford a further disunion. So the idea that Monroe and Congress have is to have Lafayette come over because um, he can rally everybody behind his legacy, right? Uh, Dr. Kramer actually in his article in our newsletter uh, talks about that and quite a lot. He, he mentions ex exactly what I just said, that you know, so if you, again, I don't want to say what is in the article, but yes, he was not, he would never, he would not have aligned himself politically because uh, he understood perfectly why he was in the Ameri in the United States for, and as it pertains to domestic politics in the United States, the idea was for him to be a unifying figure, not to uh, spur further division. Does that make sense? I hope so. I think you covered it well. She, uh, she has kind of a follow on question with that. She says, I do wonder whether his reverence for the greatest Federalist of them all, George Washington, swayed his loyalties toward their party. So beyond just the unifying factor, do you think he slightly favored the Federalists, perhaps? Well, I mean, it's, I don't know that, I don't think he would favor a party. I think, I think uh, at the end of his tour, he had a statement about a stronger central union I mean, whatever you want to interpret there that he was endorsing. I mean, I, I talked during my talk about, uh, during my, my conversation here, I talked about the strength of the public system, public education in Connecticut. So I think, I think every party in America in 1824 and later could claim a legacy of Lafayette. Uh, yeah, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far as to say that outside of the party or even just the party itself, he would, he would take a pick. I, I don't believe that. Oh, good. Uh, so the next question is from, I believe it's, is it Gillian or Jillian? Either way, sorry for my mispronunciation, but we have a visitor from England and their question is that he or she, I can't tell, I'm so sorry, uh, that they want to do a Lafayette tour and they're wondering how does that happen? Is it a commercial venture? Like, do we have it established? What would that look like? Well, I'm working on an app. Basically, I'd like people to use this website and the map I just told you about. I would like that. You basically turn on like your GPS and it shows you which marker is next to you. And then you have information about where to stay overnight. And then uh, the local historical society that they, tell you what they, they can tell you what they have about Lafayette. So this is in the works basically as we prepare for the bicentennial of 2024. There's a lot going on. A lot of my time is already taken by fundraising and placing markers. But I do want to make sure that there is actually a possible trail that people can follow and then just stop from one place to another in order to find out whichever information locally is available as it pertains to Lafayette. I think it will be very good to have that ready for 2024. Uh, so Jillian, just keep in touch with us. And uh, I think uh, we'll have some answers for you practically on the ground pretty soon, I would hope. Good. Um, I think one thing that it will also be wonderful is that we're hoping that once people do go on the trail, they'll take photos and share their journeys with us. So we're Absolutely. looking forward to that. Uh, so the next question was from Heath, and they're asking, is this being recorded? Yes. Uh, did you want to share about our future ideas about the video platforms? 
Well, we're going to have some videos that are we're working again. It's about fundraising. If we have the funds available to do that, uh, we would like to do some videos to cover those dedication ceremonies. I think, um, I mean, videos are very expensive again, 25 states, let alone the geographic coverage that we have to do. It. I mean, it's a lot of money. We are going to get ready with platforms, whether it's Vimeo platform or YouTube platform. We're going to anticipate that uh, we're going to have some ground, uh, uh, you know, uh, ground up um, support uh, eventually. I hope that that turns out to be the case. And then we will be advertising this on our platforms virtually because you know what, with COVID, it's very simple to keep in touch with people virtually and um, put this uh, educational contents out there online for people to see. They don't expire, uh, they don't get old. Maybe they get old with the, 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 the quality of the video, but point is you can, you, can take a look, you can take a look at the video from home, safe and sound. You don't have to go anywhere. You don't have to shake anybody's hand if you don't want to. And it's really just a good way to do it. And I think we should embrace that fully. We already do. I mean, you get a sense of the strength of our digital resources on at the Lafayette Trail. We want to do that. And I think video uh, hosting platforms are just going to be a natural follow-up on our um, approach. Wonderful. Uh, we have a great uh, comment from Matt. Uh, he says, I'm joining the Lafayette Trail tonight, and I invite all in attendees to do so as well. And please, if you're not already a member of the Branford Historical Society, please join us too, so that we can continue to support programs such as these. So I think that was really important to highlight. And, oh, sorry, go on. No, no, I just said thank you so much for the kind note. That's very nice. I'm, I, I, I'm grateful. <laughs> yeah, we appreciate it. Uh, this, following up with that, people are recommending Turn, Washington Spies, which is a great historical series yeah. founded with the American Revolution and Lafayette features throughout it all. So I recommend it. It's really great as well. Perfect. And then um, Scarlett asks, do you have a story about Lafayette's tour that not many people know about, either a funny story or an interesting fact that's not well known? Oh, yeah, we all have plenty. I mean, one I can think of right now is about a little dog that Lafayette had uh, gone. He, he became very fond of that dog. Actually, it was quite a struggle for a long time to document that. And we're very lucky at the Lafayette Trail to have an amazing treasurer and researcher that actually did a, some quite a lot of research to make sure that this this story was substantiated. So yeah, he actually had a little dog that was traveling with him. Uh, his name was Quiz, And uh, the little dog actually disappeared at some point throughout the journey. But we do know for a fact that he was still alive in Georgia, that Lafayette had traveled with him, and that eventually uh, when he gets to Boston in June 1825, by that time, there's another primary source document that actually tells you that he disappeared. And that's all I'm going to say. I'm not going to tell you where the data, uh, the data is from or anything because we actually want to write a story about this in our newsletter for members. But uh, we do have stories like that quite a lot. I mean, I can tell you so many things about diplomas that were given to Lafayette as an honorary uh, gesture for his commitment to American freedom. Uh, we have all of this data. The point I want to make is we have, I've spent a year doing research on this, going with my little car with a New Hampshire license plate all the way to Louisiana. I've been to 320, to 320 cities and towns, okay? I have so many data, so much data that I can share, uh, your head would spin. And uh, I just want to publish it in the newsletter. But those are two stories that I can think of because I think it's very cute with the dog. And the honorary degrees, it shows you how revered he was, revered he was around across the country. And I believe that we'll be having different people on future talks and lectures to discuss different aspects of the trailer, different topics or parts of Lafayette's life. So whether it's in the newsletter or in our discussions, I'm sure we'll be able to share a lot of other great, unique content with you all. Uh, Betsy asks, how did Lafayette survive through the French Revolution and Napoleon? So uh, the French Revolution was kind of a struggle for him. So I told you about the, the, the revolutionary plantation he started in 1785. So that collapsed in 1792 because of a situation in France. Okay, so what happened in Lafayette in France is that, unlike in America, Lafayette is not in France celebrated as widely as he is today because he was never a national icon. Matter of fact, he was very early on, um, let's put it like that, when the revolutionary leaders in, during the French Revolution took over the government in Paris, uh, they did not want Lafayette on their side because Lafayette always wanted to maintain a constitutional monarchy. He didn't want to get rid of the king at first, at least, and actually never did. And he didn't believe that if uh, a system properly reproduced like the U.S. in France, <laughs> transplanted like that would work, he wanted to maintain the king, and people did not follow him with that. They actually wanted to 
capture him and you know the you know the rest basically if they had captured him so they did not capture him as a result he had to relinquish his military command in 1792 he fled for his life he was captured and spent uh, five years in jail now the, so he was freed in 1797 now the relationship with napoleon is that when napoleon takes over after the the craziness of the french revolution and this is all in a nutshell okay but the idea is that La napoleon frees lafayette he wants lafayette to serve in his government because he understands that Lafayette is a very popular figure nevertheless with the people, not with the leaders, but with the people. He thinks it would be a great political asset to have him on his side, but Lafayette refuses. Because Lafayette does not want to get along or doesn't want to do anything, does not want to have anything to do with Napoleon, he does not play any major political role in France's history for another 10, 15 years. Actually, he comes back as a um, minority leader, sort of, if you could say that now in 1918. So if you connect it with the tour that I talked about tonight, um, Lafayette once in 1818, 1820, when France goes back to the Bourbon restoration, so the, the family that ruled France for so long, actually they have a little bit of a time frame when they go back on to power. And Lafayette at that time, it actually coincides with him going to the United States. And the idea is also to bring back the lessons of the American experiment to see if we can improve upon the political system in France. So that's why he also was very careful about Louisiana because Louisiana had such a strong French background that he was hoping how can, he was hoping to find out the answer at the question, how can the French be compatible with a you know, republic? democratic ideals. And he was hoping he could find the answers in Louisiana. That's why he spent so much time there. I mean, usually he spends a night or two in a town, but in Louisiana, I spend, you know, almost a week. And so, yeah, I, I guess I've, I've gone a little too far here, but I think I provided an answer, hopefully. No, I think so. And on, well, and on that note, I know we're getting lots of questions right now, and I know we're past uh, the hour mark, uh, but uh, maybe we'll take a few more questions yeah, yeah, before Matt I think wraps I think it up. Good. Yeah. Okay, good. Uh, the following question was, is the U.S. government funding this project? No. No, we actually rely exclusively on donations of people like you and some foundations that we try to apply to. Uh, COVID doesn't make anything easy, obviously. And the fact that we, our project is 25 states, when you apply to a grant in Boston, they don't want, they don't like the idea that their dollar is going to benefit Alabama. And when you apply in Alabama, they don't like the idea that New Hampshire is going to get a little bit of their money. So it's complicated to actually get some money by state uh, societies, but individuals, wherever they are in this country, usually is what feel, fuels the finances of the Lafayette Trail, which is badly needed at the moment. So yeah, that's uh, mostly individually powered. We really appreciate all your help. Uh, on that note, uh, this one might be a kind of controversial statement perhaps, but because there's so many takes on it, but Susan's asking, what are your thoughts, Julian, on Lafayette's depiction in Turn and in Hamilton? Oh, have you seen either uh, of those? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, I don't. Lafayette does not have a major role anyway in Ham. I mean, I don't know what to say. Uh, he he's not just the major focus of, of Hamilton. I mean, he goes away very early in the play, and then that's it. You don't see him for you know a long time. So I, I I don't know what to say here. I don't think that it, it's a problem at all. That what do I think? I think uh, I don't think he has much attention in the play. It, wish there was more, right? <laughs> yeah, I would think so. Yeah. And then um, have you seen Turn at all? No. Oh, no. Okay, well, get that on your list and then we'll have to come back to you, Susan, yeah. and let you know what he thinks. Exactly. I think we can do a few more. I, I, I guess we can, we can end like 10 minutes and then we follow up with email as we do usually, is that, if that's okay. Yeah, with if anyone would like to stay. Let's go. Okay, let's, well, let's, let's keep moving then. Let's go. Oh, good. Let's go. Uh, so, uh, Robert asks, Julian, what influence on Lafayette's views came from his experience in jail in Europe? Uh, well, Lafayette was a um, strong opponent to solitary confinement. So I don't know how his personal experience shaped his view on this. Uh, I would imagine that spending a few time, uh, spending some years in jail does not make, make you a strong advocate in favor of solitary confinement. Um, I would imagine that, yeah, the fact that he went to jail even increased how strongly 
he felt about this issue. And matter of fact, if you go around the tour, we have also some data to share about this. He went to see a, a prison in America, in around Philadelphia, actually, in 18th, the penitentiary, the Eastern Penitentiary, what's now the Eastern Penitentiary. And uh, yeah, he, he basically, throughout the tour, I have some letters with leaders at the time that I've found. He talks about opposing solitary confinement and how necessary it is to end it in this country as a, you know, uh, uh, the law of the land because of how incompatible it is with uh, um, uh, a free country. So uh, yeah, I, uh, that's, that's, that's how I, I would see the connection here. Um, I, would, I, would, I would stop my answer here actually. Okay. Um, another question is, did his wife write any memoirs or be totally with him on the journey? Is he... No taught about in French schools? So it's a few questions all in right. one. So no, uh, no, the wife didn't come on the tour. She had passed away by then. Um, she, uh, the, uh, what, what, what basically, I, I would say she had an influence on Lafayette earlier in his life, basically. Um, and uh, what, was the, what was the second part of the question? I'm sorry. Um, if she wrote any memoirs? No, so, we, we, not, not any major writing that we can use as, uh, I mean, I, I haven't been able to, to find anything major uh, that I could use for my work. I, I know, of course, she was active in the plantation uh, that they try to do in order to revolutionize and end slavery early on in America. But that's really, that's really her most, I would say, successful um, commitments to Lafayette, except the fact that she actually went to join him in jail when he was in jail for se several years. Um, I mean, what a great proof of affection for him that it was. It's amazing. These are two things that I would think stand aside and show how great of a woman she was. Um, I don't know about the writings, though. Um, yeah, I don't know. Okay, um, and then the last one on that was, is he taught about in French schools? No, well, he taught very quickly. Um, I mean, it was not so long ago that I had to go through the program myself, I suppose, so I can, I can, I can give quite a little bit of an... Uh, an updated view of what the programs are. Um, Lafayette is well. Number, number one, you ba you very barely hear that he was a hero in the American Revolution. The programs really focus on the fact that he played a role in the French Revolution. He was, um, you know, the the Declaration of the Rights of Men of the Citizen. That was him. Uh, the National Guard. That was him. The French flag. The colors of the French flag. That was him. So I, I think that's really, they don't even go farther than that at all because they don't have time. I mean, they have so much to cover and I get it. I mean, it's not like I'm criticizing the programs. Maybe uh, now that I'm so much into Lafayette, I wish they would do a little more to the kids in France so that they would make them more aware of that American connection that I myself discovered later on in my life with the United States. But I also understand they don't have much time to you know, drill down on a person they have to cover the French Revolution in so many hours. I mean, you can only do so much with so many hours, you know what I'm saying? So I'm, 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 that's, that's what I would say, yeah. Oh, good. Now, there's a few questions that seem similar. One is very specific about uh, George Washington's relationship with Lafayette. And okay. they're asking about, is it a romantic relationship? And the follow-on questions are similar, asking what was his relationship with Thomas Jefferson and Alexander Hamilton? Sure. So uh, with George Washington is more of a, and that's, that's my take at it. I, I like to say like it, it is a, um, it's, it's more of a natural friendship that they have with uh, between Washington and Lafayette. They get along very well. As I said, uh, George Washington was kind of a father figure or a paternal friend for Lafayette. He, uh, Washington didn't have a son and Lafayette lost his, both of his parents very at a very young age. So they had this connection that was uh, more, of, yeah, more of an intimate connection, I would say. Whereas with Thomas Jefferson, what I have found during my research is that uh, although they met also early on during the Revolutionary War, it is a friendship that is based upon correspondence throughout the years. So we also talked about ending slavery with Thomas Jefferson, okay, throughout the, his life. But uh, of course, George Washington died in 1799. So, you know, at the time, Lafayette was still young and he basically uh, didn't have all those years to communicate with George Washington. All he could do is pay respect to uh, Washington at his grave, at his tomb in 1824, right? That's all. But with Thomas Jefferson, what I like about that is that uh, 
you have so many things going on in the 1800s. I mean, Jefferson becomes president. They all talk to each other with letters. I found a letter that Lafayette talks about. Congratulations, Mr. Jefferson, on the purchase of Louisiana. I will be great for the country. By the way, a couple of days ago, I broke my hip. I mean, this is kind of how intimate they were. He talks about two things totally different in the same letter, only separate uh, by one paragraph, one from another, right? Like, I broke my, I broke my leg. And by the way, congratulations on buying Louisiana. So <laughs> you find this level of intimacy with Jefferson that's um, achieved throughout uh, the years because of regular correspondence, whereas with George Washington, it was more of an, uh, you know, feelings, natural feelings as friends, as father and son, kind of, uh, you, you, I don't want to say father and son, it's kind of a little too much, but, you know, a paternal friend is a good, it's a good way to put it. So, yeah, there's, uh, hopefully that, that answers the question. And as for Alexander Hamilton, I suppose, uh, same thing. He died very early on, actually, so he didn't have the chance. But he, he did not have a just like Washington and Lafayette uh, had. They, he did not have the close bond that he had with Washington, uh, except of course the fact that they they served together at Yorktown, and that the story of Yorktown is usually told with the two names Hamilton and Lafayette inseparable from one another. Uh, and of course, the play Hamilton kind of brings them together even more. But I wouldn't go so far as to claim that they were super close as Washington and Lafayette were. Oh, wonderful. I think that covers quite a few people and relationships in a really short time period. So uh, hopefully that answers most people's questions. I think this will be our last question for the evening okay. is from Kaylin. And she asks, did Lafayette ever meet Angelica, Angelica Schuler that you know of? Um, so the Schuyler family, one of the markers Schuyler, that we're going to have, one of the markers that we're going to have soon is, uh, at the Schuyler's estate. So I would, I know in the day that there's a mention of Elizabeth Schuyler, uh, I don't know about the other sister, um, so I, I would have to follow up with the person that asked the question on this. I know that, I mean, Philip Schuyler was dead in 1824, but Elizabeth, he paid, he paid a visit to the Schuyler's ma uh, mansion in uh, upstate New York near Albany. And uh, I, I'll just take a look at the data. I don't remember off the top of my head, as you can imagine, um, through 800 stop, 300 and 320 cities in town, you can go crazy very quickly, which probably already happened to me. So I'll have to follow up with you on this. Oh, wonderful. I think that's all of our questions for this evening. Right. So if Matt or Mike would like to hop on, please feel free. Mike? Yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I just want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Uh, Julian, what a wonderful program. Um, if you want more information, please contact Julian directly, correct? Yeah, absolutely. The Lafayette Trail.org. There's a way to contact us. Inquiries at the Lafayette Trail.org. Or if you want to get all the newsletter things and everything, you also can become a member. Yeah. So. Okay, great. And Ashley, thank you for taking all the questions. And uh, a special thanks again to Jenna for setting all this up. So thank you, everybody. I'm going to sign off now. Now, have a good night. You too. Thank you so much, everybody. Take care and stay safe. Thank, thanks, oh, Mike. Uh, Julian, if I could add uh, something. Uh, yeah. Uh, a couple quick notes. Uh, I'm the president of the society, and uh, we really appreciate you being available for this. We so much would have loved to have you in person in Brantford. It would have been great, but this was a great stand-in. We thank Ashley for her work. I thank Mike, who takes no credit whatsoever, but does a great job setting up our programs and, totally. and being the go-between and getting all this done. Uh, the personnel at the Blackstone Library, Mike knows exactly who did all that great work, and, and uh, I'm sure he'll reach out to them. Um, to all the attendees, uh, quick note for Jillian. It was actually, I understand, a British officer who acquainted Lafayette with the American rebel cause and caused Lafayette to rush off to the new world. Um, happened in the city of Metz, I believe. So that, that's a fascinating little bit for any Brit who's uh, – tuned in. Uh, oh, and also Lafayette, I understand, was joined in his jail in uh, Olmutz, Germany, by his daughters as well as his wife. Yeah, correct. And he showed clothing for him. That's amazing. Um, so as a final note, thanks to everybody involved. Th this was great. I hope that we can do something again. I'll recommend this to other historical societies. 
uh, Julian, if you want me to. It might be too draining you for you. You, 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 might, you, go you go right ahead. We, we will welcome the opportunities, no problem. You, you, you might say no, no. No, that's all right. I, no, I enjoyed it. I mean, you know, I'm, I, I'm very at ease with uh, digital technology and everything. I love that. I mean, I wish we could all get together, but, you know, I understand, so. If you it, want to say, is, say, say, say trop de travail, that's fine. Um, <laughs> no, that's all right. I mean, it's, we're, 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 we have a lot of work, but it's, it's always great to share that info with people. It really is. And, and as I put into the chat, two final notes. I'm going to be joining the Lafayette Trail tonight because I, I think that it uh, really uh, deserves our support. I'm going to push for getting a plaque uh, erected in Brantford so that people have more of a sense of that history. Okay. And for, 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 for any attendees uh, who are not members of the society now, we, of course, want to keep bringing you these programs, and we need your support to do it. So, Julian, Ashley, everybody involved, Mike, all of our volunteers, and everybody at Blackstone, thank you very much. You got it. Have a great night, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bye. Thank you Bye -bye. everyone.